Good morning, Atherton Uniting Church, and welcome to church this morning. Good morning um, to you as a part of the Church International. And I'd, I'd just like to welcome you. Let's open with prayer. Loving God, as we come this morning to worship you, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity of um, being able to meet together over the sound waves, even though we cannot meet in person. And we've been restricted by that, by our governments and by the, the coronavirus. We thank you that there is technology that enable us, enables us to reach across and greet each other by the hand. And so mentally we greet the people that we love in this church and the people that, that we, we, not, we don't know so well in the church. Lord, we reach out and we ask that you would bless this service and bless this time together. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Ben will bring us the readings this morning. Thanks, Ben. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday Church. It's a wonderful day, and I just hope you're all well where you are. And today I'll be reading John 17, 1 to 11. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the works you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I have with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I give them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I prayed for them. I am not praying for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all that you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. And now I'd like to invite Johnson to come and share with you his message today, and may God bless you all richly. In Jesus' name. Morning, church. Uh, today we want to thank God that um, we are able to worship Him and to listen to the Word of God from our different places. Today, for the reading comes from the book of John, chapter 17, verse 1 to 11. I have come up with a theme: the meaning of life. The meaning of life. Um, if you read in Acts 5, scene 5 of Shakespeare's Macbeth, the character Macbeth has heard that the queen is dead and he knows his own death is imminent. And at this time he delivers his famous soliloquy. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools. The way to dust death out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. 
a poor player that strives and frets his how upon the stage and then his head no more, told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Is Macbeth right? Is life nothing but a shadow having no substance, no meaning? Writers and philosophers since recorded time have tried to answer the question. I don't think any of them have been successful in answering the question to everyone's satisfaction. Someone once said that trying to speak about the ultimate reality is like sending a kiss through a messenger. I understand their point. Something of this truth is lost in the translation. What is the meaning of life? A philosophical question to be sure that this is not only the philosopher's question. It is a genuine human question and therefore a question that we all ask. It might be a question that is asked in despair or hope, out of cynicism or out of sincere curiosity and a desperate, deep de desire to have goals and guidance in life. However, we raise the question about the meaning of life. It is our most basic and fundamental question, what is life? And so it comes as no surprise that Jesus deals with this question and answers it. Surprisingly, the answer is not given in the context of an argument with the Jewish leaders or in a discussion with his disciples. And it is not given in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus deals with so many fundamental issues. It is telling that Jesus deals with the meaning of life in the context of prayer. In the context of what has been called by many scholars Jesus' high priestly prayer, the disciples are in the upper room now. They have just finished the Passover meal and Jesus is thinking about this, his crucifixion which will occur within the 24 hours. He knows he is about to leave his disciples and alone in the world and he goes before God as a priesthood to intercede for them, to pray for them. Listen again to his prayer. I am lifting out a few key verses. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe, but I will remain in the world no longer. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your holy name. The name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Father, the time has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority all over people that he might give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It is in this third verse of John 17, verse 3, that Jesus delivers the meaning of eternal life, and in essence, the meaning of life itself. He says, now is... Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Why were you put on this earth? It's my question. Why were you put on this earth? What should be your greatest goal in life? What is the single greatest achievement you could obtain on this earth? What is the secret to eternal life? The answer to all of this question is the same. It is found in two ways, knowing God. To know God and to know him fully. The only true God, to know the only true God. In essence, Jesus says the meaning of life is that you have a relationship with God and me, his son, Jesus Christ, and that's the long and short of it. You need to have a relationship with Christ. That is the meaning of life. But Jesus himself understood just how difficult it was going to be, not only for his disciples, but for all of us to come to this very simple realization in life. And so he prays for two key things. First, in order that we might understand the meaning of life. That was his prayer. Second, that is what God wants from you and for you more anything else in your life. God said in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, in, um, I would rather for you to be faithful and to know me than to offer us sacrifice. More than your time, more than your talent, more than your treasure, God wants you to know him and to know him personally. 
God wants to know you, to know him. Today, the popular thing is to know yourself. It's about selfie. It's about me. Find out who you are. Get in touch with your inner feelings. Discover the real you. Let me let you know in a little secret. Unless you get to know God, you never get to know yourself. Romans 8 verse 6 says, <clears throat> Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious free life. So Jesus is praying for our protection from the world. We do not need protection from we do need protection from the world because the world can steal life from us. The day in and day out attitudinousness and challenges life can be overwhelming. Sometimes life can be just too long, too hard, and too boring, and we can lose our Christian hope and joy and succumb to despair. It's then that we try to find meaning in life in things other than God. We look for escape through a bottle of wine or whatever I drink. We look for happiness in the form of another woman. We look for stability in life through another man. We try to resolve conflict through violence or we try to solve material desires by stealing. Jesus understood these trials and temptations and so he prayed, Holy Father, protect them from the world so they may be one as we are one. Police officers guard our communities. The law and rules protect our society. Parents teach honesty and integrity to their children so they will then grow up to uphold decent norms of behavior. We all need someone to keep us safe. Some of us even need protection from our own fathers or mothers. So why should it surprise us that our souls need to be safeguarded from the corruption of the world? Jesus prayed for his disciples that the Father would protect them and keep them from losing their way in the world. Jesus knew only if God protected them would they be able to discover the ultimate meaning of life. We need a safe environment. I don't think this means merely a safe physical and social environment where we are dis distancing ourselves from the coronavirus. But a safe spiritual environment to nature or commitment to God is also needed. Jesus understood how difficult it was going to be for us to understand the meaning of life. It's difficult because there are so many ways to get lost in the world. But the way is open because God is here to protect us. And that's why he said, protect them, Father. To give our souls the security that we need in order to hear his call and follow. This brings us to the second part of this, his prayer. In order that we might understand the meaning of life. He prays that we might know God. Moses, when he brought down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, he gathered all Israel and he read the commandments before the people. And then he summed up the Ten Commandments in these ways. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. When Jesus was asked by an expert in the law, what is the greatest commandment in all the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In Matthew 22, verse 37. And on the evening before his crucifixion, Jesus prays, he prays that the disciples will come to know God in a personal way. Actually, Jesus is simply echoing those words of Moses. He is restating the lines in a brief phrase, that they may know you, the only true God. That they may know you, the only true God. Jesus has been talking about knowing God like you know your ABC. Let's not kid ourselves. Gentlemen, when your wife tells you that she wants to know you better, she doesn't mean your shoe size. She's talking about an intimacy. She wants to know you personally. That's what Jesus is praying for. And I want to tell you how hard this is. It's hard enough to let our family in door of our hearts and let alone God. And yet that is what is being asked of you. I tell you this is the only way to find meaning in life. To know God personally. And that's the only way your children, your grandchildren will find meaning in their lives. 
When Moses read of all Israel, the Ten Commandments, and summed up by saying, love God with all your heart, he added something very important. Teach these commands to your children. When it comes to knowing God, there are four groups of people in this world, and maybe four are in this congregation, maybe today. Or they're also listening to what I'm saying. There are people who don't know God, and they know they don't know God. They would make no pretense about it. They either don't believe in God or they believe in God, but don't acknowledge a personal relationship with him and have no desire to have a personal relationship with God. Those are the first group of people. The second one, there are people who don't know God, but they think they do. This includes a lot of religious people, a lot of people who regularly attend church and they honestly think that they know God, but they really don't know God. The third group, there are people who know God, but they are not sure they know God. I've met a lot of these people who really do know God, perhaps not as well as they should, but they know him, but they are just not sure that they have a personal relationship with him. The fourth one, there are people who know God and they know they know God. There are people who know God and have a deep personal relation with God and you would never ever ever able to convince them otherwise. You cannot change them because they know God. Even what is being said in the world, even the philosophy of what is being said in the world, they don't listen to that because they know God. They've got a personal relationship with God. The Apostle John referred to these types of people when he said in verse 3, in 1 John 2 verse 3, now by this we know that we know him. We know that we know him. We know that he lives. The Apostle John said it is possible not only to know God, but to know that you know the true God. Do you know that you can know the true God? Do you know that you can know that you know the true God? I would like to make three simple statements that can transform your life and can totally transform how you see your relationship with God. Listen again to verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Let those two statements sink. You can know God. You can know that you know God. You can know that you have got a relationship with God. The very reason that Jesus came to this earth is so that you and I could know God and become God's friend. The Bible says, now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. All because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends with God. Romans 5 verse 11. So we become friends with God. We may know that. Think about that. You can know God to such an extent that you, you and he are the best friends. God wants to be your best friend. He wants you to be his best friend. This is not only why Jesus came. It is why God sent Jesus. So that you can become God's best friend. All this is done by God through whom Christ changed us from enemies into his friends. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 18. Can you think of a greater privilege in this life than becoming a friend of God? That is why I say to you equivocally, life's greatest privilege ever is knowing God. You need to know God in your life. You know you can learn a lot about people by what they break about. I want you to listen to what God himself said that you ought to break about. This is what the Lord says in Jeremiah 9 verse 23 and 24. Let not the wise men boast of his wisdom or a strong men boast of his strength or the rich men boast of his riches. But let him boast and boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Anyone should take that pride that I know God and I know him personally. That is the only thing you can be proud of. Proud of. How many times do you hear people bragging about how much they knew? How much they are? How many things they have? Do you know why people brag about these things? People break about these material things. That's the thing they break about. Because people want to be intellectual. So they break about how much they know, how many degrees they have. They want to be influential, so they break about how much, how mighty they are in the world. Do you know me? I am so and so. 
I am the governor. I am the MP. I am the prime minister. I am so... So people break about those things. They want to be imperial, so they break about how many things they have. God says, the only thing worth breaking about in this life is that you understand him and know him more. That word know in the Hebrew language means to know with your senses. Not just in your mind. It is not just an intellectual knowledge. This is an emotional knowledge. It means not just knowing about God in your head. It means knowing God in your heart. So you need to know him. To know God in your heart. You can know much about God without knowing God. Let me ask you the question of the day. Do you know God? I'm not asking whether you know about God. I'm not asking your theological IQs, intelligent questions. No. I'm asking, do you really know God? I'm not asking how much the Bible trivia you can recite or even how many Bible verses you have memorized. I will admit that you have got to know something about God before you can know God. But you can know much about God without knowing God. So the average person thinks that just by believing in God, all is, that is necessary. That is a long way from knowing God and having a relationship with God. The world is filled with people who acknowledge the existence of God in some way or other, but they don't know him. In fact, some have denied that you can know him. Read a, a lot of, I've read a lot of books. There are people who have denied that God, you cannot know God. They even denied that God does not exist. Not only those who have written books or whoever have died, but even some people who are living today, whom I know, who profess that God doesn't exist. One of the things you ought to pray for is that you would grow in your knowledge of God. Paul said in Ephesians 1 verse 17 that we ought to be asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Me meaning that you need to know God more fully, more personal. You never really know somebody until you either marry them or live with them. The more time you spend with someone, the more you get to know them and the better you get to know them. The same thing is true with God. You can grow in knowledge of God you ought to know God better today than you knew him yesterday. And better to know tomorrow than you knew him today. I want to share with you three practical steps you can take to grow in your knowledge of God. First of all, practice God's presence. Two, train your mind to remember God's consistency. Three, maintain continuous contact with him. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, pray all the time. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, ponder God's principles. If you really want to grow in your knowledge of God, you have to get as deeply as you can into the Bible. You need to read the Bible. It becomes your food, your daily food, your daily devotion. The more you know that God says, the more you hear what God wants. The more you hear what God wants, the better you are able to carry out his will. The better you are able to carry out his will, the closer you will get to him. The closer you get to him, the better you will know him. So you need to be closer to God. I hope I've given you a thirst and a hunger to really know God. If I haven't yet, maybe this statement will. Knowing God is not only the key to eternal life, it is the essence of eternal life. John 17 verse 3 says, Eternal life is to know you, the only true God and to know Jesus Christ, the one you said. So we need to know the only true God. That is eternal life. That is why I can say to you today, there is nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing more important than knowing God. Only those who know God will enjoy eternal life in heaven. The apostle God made a statement, the apostle for God, uh, Paul, made a statement to Timon that says it all. Some of these People have missed the most important thing in life and they don't know God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 21. Did you know that you can know God? Did you know that you can know that you do not know God? <laughs> you can know him through knowing his son. 
Jesus Christ and you can know that you know him through obeying his commands and there's nothing more important than that. God gives us protection and he desires that you have a personal relationship with him. I am not speaking primarily to the lost this morning. I am talking to the Christian community. Remember that Jesus' prayer was for his disciples. Those who had already walked with him for three years, we have a need to deepen our relationship with God. We need to come closer to God. Jesus prays that we might do so. Will you pray that you might come to know God more deeply so that you can be one even as Jesus and the Father are one? Hear all Christian. Instead of hear all Israel, I'm now going to say, hear all Christian. The Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with your soul and with all your might. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord help you to have that relationship with God. That knowledge of knowing that I am so close to God. You can know it. You need that close relationship with God. May the good Lord bless you from today and onwards. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless us this morning as we are gathered before your throne, as we are gathered in our different places. Father, we come before you. We want to know you, to know you better. We want to have that close relationship. We want to come closer to you. Father, help us. Yes, sometimes we are weak. We are challenged by things that happen in the world. It could be the coronavirus. These are some of the challenges. But all these ch challenges, this is not the first one. There are so many challenges which are there in this world. And they come and go. Father, we pray that even this coronavirus is going to go. It's not going to stay. We pray that, Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue to know you, we have that close relationship with you. That we are able to remain in you and you in us. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us. This close relationship you have given us that we may come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, I would just encourage you to, um, to spend the time with the offering and think of your offering, but not just offering of money and, and that, but offering of all of your talents and your abilities. I worked out the other day, if we tied our time, it would be 2.4 hours a day. And, uh, and, and some of us, myself included, only for him to spend a fraction of that time. And maybe let's use this time to spend time with God. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for to accept what we give you. We thank you that you use not only our gifts, but you use us if we freely offer ourselves. So we give to you what is really yours, and we ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. And we also ask that that which we have kept behind, the money which we've kept behind, that we would be wise stewards of how we spend our money on ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.